Guys, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit today. The next three classes, listen to me on this. The next three classes are completely devoted to the work of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to just get in there and really, really hear what God's Word has to say on some of these issues. Do you realize that there has been so much division in the church when it comes to the, to the subject of the Holy Spirit? Do you know that? There's been a lot of division in the church when it comes to the subject of the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you a question. Isn't unity one of the cornerstones that, uh, of the Holy Spirit's work? One of the most important attributes of the Holy Spirit's work is supposed to be what? Unity. And yet there's so much disunity. I don't think it has anything to do with the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit brings unity. I believe it's that the enemy comes in there, mixes things up for us, and we fail to understand what the Spirit of God is sharing with us through His Word. And so I believe that His Word will lead us if we just get in there and try to uncover what, what it is that we need to learn. So I want to share with you that today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the, just the introduction of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, I, I wish I had time to spend, you know, six weeks on this, but summer's coming, and so we have to, we have to get to summer uh, and, and have, it, have it be in a, in a time frame where, where you get the most out of it. So I'm not going to share with you all the verses that I could share with you talking about the deity of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is in fact the Spirit of God and, and is God. And so uh, in case you're wondering, you know, we are Trinitarians and we believe that God presents himself in three persons, but he is one in essence. And that is, uh, he, he is three in one, so to speak. And so you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when the, when the son said, I will send the spirit to you, he meant literally he would send the spirit and he did. He sent the spirit and, uh, and the spirit was uh, manifested and fulfilled prophecy on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But I, I just want you guys to get your questions ready. We'll have question and answer probably next week if we don't, if I don't have enough time to do it this week. But uh, can we just dive right into it? You guys ready? All right, here we go. As we dive right in, I want to share with you, and uh, I'm going to ask you to bear with me because I'm going to navigate between my notes that are a little bit more detailed than yours and the screen that Christian will be putting up here. But the first verse I want to share with you is found in John chapter 14, verse 15. I'll start on verse 15, and the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commands. Who's speaking here? Jesus is speaking, isn't he? And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And uh, hold on real quick. I'm going to minimize some stuff here. All right, I'm ready to go. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. So he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to ask the Father to send for you a helper. Someone that will advocate for you. Somebody that will be with you. Who is he talking about here? Listen to this. The Spirit of Truth. So another name for the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. He guides believers into truth. You want to know his truth? Ask the Spirit of God. He will lead you into truth. Now listen to this. He goes on to say, the world cannot accept him. So that gives you another clue. The Spirit of God is for who only? Come on, say it loud. For believers. It's for those who are followers of Christ. So he's saying very, very plainly, listen, if they do not believe in me, if they do not accept me, the Spirit is not for them. Now, incidentally, in another verse, uh, which I didn't include today, and, and I've included almost 50 verses, but... This verse, when John says, no one comes to God unless the Holy Spirit, what? Draws them. So the Holy Spirit is drawing everyone. And there is a possibility for us to what? Deny the Holy Spirit. For us to say, no, thank you. I don't want you. 
Now, some would say that's the ultimate sin when you deny him for the last time. When you finally say, no, 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 no. I don't know when that point takes place, but some would say that's the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit when you say, no. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you die without the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's been drawing you and drawing you and drawing you and you've been saying, no, 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 eventually you will die without who? Christ. Without salvation. So listen to this. He says, The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will leave you, excuse me, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He follows this up in the very next chapter, in chapter 15, verse 26. At the end of the chapter, he says, when the advocate comes, here he is again, when the advocate comes, There's that word. What does it mean to be an advocate? He'll be a helper. He'll speak for you. He'll he'll, he'll stick up for you. He's your helper. Okay? When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about who? Me. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Now this is interesting because you have here an order of the way things are. You have God the Father who sends the Son, and the Son says what? Earlier in these verses, He says, everything you have seen me do and everything that I have done, I have taken from who? From the Father. I'm not out here doing my own will. I do the will of the Father. When I send... The Spirit who will come from the Father, He will take from who? He'll take from me, Jesus Christ, and He'll make the truth of Jesus Christ known to us. So you have here a progression of the way things should be. Jesus Christ came, He embodied the Father's love, and He shared the love with us, and now He sends the Spirit to further guide us in this truth. Let's keep going. John 16 Now, one more chapter, verse 13 through 15. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. All right? So he won't speak on his own. He will only speak what? What he hears. He will glorify me because it is what? From me. So let's read this again. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. See there? All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So this is very, very important. So here you have again, the Spirit is not doing just whatever He wants. There's an order, isn't there? Do you see the order of the way things are? And you go, oh man, you're going to bring order to this whole thing. Well, everything God does is by order and design. He's not a chaotic God. He's a, he's a God of order. He has a rhyme and a reason to everything He does. Now listen to this. These are Jesus' words again in the book of Acts. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Now, incidentally, I started on verse 4, but if you go back to verse 3, the Bible tells you that Jesus, after he was resurrected, he hung out with his disciples for how long? For 40 days. He hung out with his disciples for 40 days. He would go, and he would come, and he would appear, and he would disappear. And so he's hanging out with them, and listen to what Luke says. On one occasion... While he was eating with us, or with them, the disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the fa- that the Father promised, right? Which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. Isn't this awesome? So Jesus promises this baptism of the Holy Spirit. He promises the coming of the Holy Spirit. So today, listen to this. I want to talk to you about two things. 
One is called baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the other is called being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some might say receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving and being baptized by the Spirit are the same thing. You can put that in your notes. Receiving the Holy Spirit or being baptized by the Holy Spirit are the same thing, okay? Being filled with the Spirit is different from being baptized by the Spirit. Okay? Being filled, you could say, is synonymous with being empowered. Or three, or number, that's number two, being filled, being empowered, or being what? We call it today, we call it being anointed. Anybody ever heard that? Being anointed? Let the Spirit anoint you, you know, for the work that He wants to do through you. And so there's two distinct things that we're going to be talking about here today. And if we don't get this right, it can cause a lot of confusion. And I believe this is where a lot of the division has come in. Because what happens is we fail to realize the differences and that, and that the Bible does use these terms to describe two different things. So stay with me with, on this for a second. So we've used some verses so far to describe Jesus, Jesus' words describing the sending of who? The Holy Spirit. Now we're going to get into a little bit more specific, all right? So here we go. I'm going to finish this verse here. Let's keep going. Verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking this is going to be an earthly thing, isn't it? Are you going to re- restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You are going to witness for me. But first, you've got to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. I've been talking to you about it. We've read the verses about it. And now here it comes. Guys, I need to share something with you. What we're talking about here, you see in your notes, we're talking about a new dispensation. What is a dispensation? It's a period of time where God has been moving and acting in a certain way and dealing with his people or with a group of people in a certain way right? We said there's different dispensations. There's the dispensation of grace. There's the dispensation of the church age. There's the dispensation of the law and the Old Testament, right? And the dispensation before the flood. And you have these different times where God was dealing with it in a certain way. Now, let me ask you here, what dispensation is about to kick off right now? Come on, say it loud. The church age is about to kick off. Jesus Christ has died. He's risen from the dead. He's standing with his disciples. He's about to be taken up into heaven. And when he goes up into heaven, he's going to say what? Remember, just before he disappears into heaven, I need you to connect these dots. Here he is, 40 days with them. At the end of the Gospels, you have his resurrection. And the, the book of Acts starts with the Gospels finish. So what's the last chapter in the book of Matthew? What does that say? He says, all authority. I shouldn't say, it's these last verses where he's talking about, he's ending that chapter, so to speak. And he's saying, I'm launching you off. There's a new chapter. There's something new that's happening. And I'm handing you off to the Holy Spirit. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth are mine. Now I give you a mandate. Go. Therefore, go into all the earth, all the world, and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. How? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's significant. I need you to write that down. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, and then, then watch this. He says, and teach them everything I have taught you, and lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age, to the very end of this dispensation, to the very end of what I'm about to launch. I will be with you. And with that, he launches the church age. We talked about it in the book of Daniel, remember? 
Daniel spoke in Aramaic when he talked about the church age. And when he's talking to the Hebrew nation, to the Israel nation, he talks in Hebrew and he talks about the 70 weeks. Listen to this. The 70 weeks are broken up this way. There's 69 weeks to the point of who? Messiah being, you guys were asking me about this. Bridget just asked, is that when Messiah is crucified or is that when, what, what was that? That date in, in Daniel, that was Palm Sunday, okay? Palm Sunday, Messiah is revealed. What happens by, by Thursday, so to speak? By Thursday, he's been what? Tried and he's about to be crucified. So he, he has revealed his Messiah and he's cut off. That's the date in Daniel, 69 weeks. Then you don't see anything until the 70th week. What is the 70th week? Come on, guys, you guys got to start putting this together because we've talked about this many times. Thank you. Who said that? Return. The return, the 70th week is the seven years of tribulation. So you should be asking yourself, Daniel talks about 69 weeks and 70th week, total of 70 weeks for all of human history. He leaves out something. Because the 69th week is what? Jesus being crucified. And then all of a sudden you talk about seven years of tribulation. What is he left out? Come on. The church age. He left it out. Why? Because he wasn't writing to the church. He was writing to the Hebrew nation. See, there's different dispensations. God's dispensation to the Hebrew people is different from the dispensation to the church. I'm not saying he can't save them both by grace, but he, there's a difference. And right now you have the church age being launched by Jesus Christ as he's been resurrected. And he says, go and spread this good news. And the Bible tells us that he has caused Israel's what? Hard heart from receiving him until everyone in the Gentile world that's supposed to receive comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this is what he says through Paul. He says, when the, the time of the Gentiles is complete... Oh, come on. Somebody ought to be saying hallelujah to the Lamb of God because we're getting close to the completion. Then and only then will the 70th week begin. But we're talking about a church dispensation. This is what we're talking about here. Listen to this. We're talking about Jesus introducing the concept of ecclesia. Ecclesia means the called out ones. Ecclesia means the bride of Christ, the vine, and we are the branches. The Bible talks about this in many different ways. The flock of Jesus, of which he is the good shepherd. Listen to this. The mystery of the kingdom of God. We're talking about the household of adopted sons and daughters. The spiritual temple that Christ is the foundation of. We're talking about the body of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. And it starts with the sending of the Holy Spirit. You might be saying, okay, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with everything. Listen to me. Listen. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, the Bible says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with who? With Christ. There is neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free, nor there is neither me, uh, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. See, at the foot of the cross, it doesn't matter who you are, we're all a part of the same church equally. And you know what makes us equal? You know what makes us one? The fact that we were all baptized by the Spirit of Christ. The fact that we were all brought into adoption by Christ and the Spirit that dwells within us. Let's keep reading on this for a second with me. See? In Romans chapter 8, verses 9, or verse 9, you have here, you, however 
are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives within you or in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. They do not belong to Christ. See, what I need us to understand here is this. If we are a part of the church, then we have Christ living where? I need you to say it out loud. If you are a Christian and you are a part of the church, then Christ and His Holy Spirit lives where? Within you. Within you. This is what I need you to understand once and for all because it clears up confusion. And if Christians would understand this, then they wouldn't debate about this silly thing like like some Christians don't have the Holy Spirit. It's not possible to be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. Listen, I don't care if you're a charismatic. I don't care if you're Pentecostal. I don't care if you're a Catholic. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Period. 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 You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. You're, some, you're something else. <laughs> You might be a Buddhist, you might be a Hindu, you might be a a Muslim, but you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? That that straightens up one of the biggest debates right off the bat. Because some people say, yeah, but, but, but that denomination hasn't received the Holy Spirit. Are they right? Come on, someone with authority said, no, they're not right. Now, they could be talking about being filled. They could be talking about being empowered. But that doesn't mean they haven't received the Holy Spirit. Because to accept Christ means you accept the Spirit of God. That's what brings about the change. That's what brings you into the family. We'll read a little bit more about this. We'll read a little bit more about this. Listen, this is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus himself referred to it as such. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, which we already read, I'm going to read it again. Jesus said this, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some of you might be saying, Pastor, am I hearing you right? There's two types of baptisms. Actually, there's a lot of baptisms. But the one the New New Testament talks about are two basic ones for Christians. You have the spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit that has nothing to do with water. It has everything to do with the Spirit coming into your life and completely taking over. Okay? That's number one. That's that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then you have water baptism. Water baptism is to symbolize what happened the day you got saved. Does that make sense? Let me ask you this. How many of you have experienced a wedding ceremony of any kind, whether you were in the audience or you actually got married? Okay. Can I ask you a question? Did the bride and groom all of a sudden fall in love at the point of saying, I do? Where, where did the love happen? I don't know, but it happened sometime earlier. If they're waiting, like, I'm hoping that somehow we fall in love, like, hit me, God, with some love. You know, I wouldn't recommend that. I just wouldn't. You got to bring some love with you. And it's the same way with water baptism. You've already fallen in love with Jesus Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit has already taken place. When you come here, now all you're doing is what? doing a public declaration of what already took place. And not only that, it's, it's a physical symbolism. Christ wants you to connect the dots. How many of us need to do things physically to connect the dots? I know I do. You can explain it all you want, but sometimes you got to just let me get my hands dirty. Come on, am I the only one? And Christ knows the way he created us. So he says, you know what? I'm going to show you a physical representation of what it's like to go into the grave. Uh-oh. What it's like to come out a new man, because that's exactly what I did with you the day I saved you. We're going to talk more about this. Listen, read with me. 
Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in one place. So what's happening here? Jesus says, you need to wait here in Jerusalem. Do not leave. Now, how long was Jesus with his disciples? I'm going to throw out some clues. I need you to write these down. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says Jesus was with his disciples after the resurrection for how many days? 40 days. I need you to write down 40 days. Now, I need you to understand this. From the time he told them to wait to the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1, how many days elapsed? From the time he left, after the 40 days, to the time the, the, the Holy Spirit actually came, how many days elapsed? Ten. Ten days. Good guess, Imelda. Ten days. You find it in those verses. I don't have time to read them all. But you find ten days, okay? Now, what does the Bible say here? When the day of Pentecost had fully come. What does that mean? Doesn't that sound like an awkward way of saying when Pentecost happened? Anyone say, you know, there's got to be more to this. Could it be that the Spirit is saying when in the fullness of time, when it was perfect time and the hour had happened and everything was set? Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say when the guys prayed really hard. It doesn't say when they were patient and kind and they really kind of just conjured up. It doesn't say that they had anything to do with it. What it says is in the fullness, when it was time, right? When the Holy Spirit had ordained, now I will come. He came. This is important because the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, does it, does it have anything to do with us? Come on now. Come on now. Salvation. Do, can you take credit for that? Can you take credit for it? Can, you take, can anyone take credit for salvation? Say, no, no, look, Jesus did a lot, but let me share with you what I did. Well, when you put it that way, well, how, are, how else do you want to put it? See, we got to think through things. We got to think through things because this verse has given us a clue. When the Holy Spirit first comes and you're first baptized, you don't have to do a thing but receive. We've said that. When someone wants to give you a gift, can you earn it? Can you coerce them into doing it? It's not a gift anymore. A true gift can only be received. You open your hands. Well, if you receive the gift of life, you open your heart, you open your soul, you open yourself and you say, Lord, baptism. That's what happened. Ten days. Now watch. Watch this. We're going to build some cool stuff here. It's better than Legos. We're, we're, we're building something here. It, it is better than Legos. Watch this. To be Shavat. Shavatin. I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but to be Shavatin literally means, listen to this, the feast of harvest. It also means Pentecost. So literally, Pentecost took place on Tube Shavatin, the Feast of Harvest. You go, what does that have to do with anything? I thought, what does that have to do with anything for years until I started looking into it? What? Why would Pentecost take place? And why would it say, in the fullness, then the Holy Spirit came. And he came on this holiday, on this celebration. Well, it's important to realize that there are three major feasts that take place during this short period of time that have something to do with Jesus Christ and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Three major feasts. I want you to follow with me. The first one, whoops, The first one you'll see here is the Passover. Now, what happens at the Passover? 
Anyone getting bored? Come on, stay with me, guys. What happens at the Passover? Jesus Christ is crucified. Do you remember when John the Baptist introduced Jesus to his disciples? And some of his disciples, some of John the Baptist's disciples, ended up being whose disciples? Jesus' disciples. Do you remember what he said? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, what is Passover? Passover was was instituted, the very first Passover was, was where? It was in Egypt. It was in the book of Exodus as they were getting ready to exit slavery. Listen to this. Listen, to with, listen real good on this. God told them, look, I have been sending plague after plague after plague. You've seen Charlton Heston go before Ramsey and say, you know, let my people go. And he just refuses and refuses and refuses. Plague after plague after plague. And then God sends the ultimate, the angel of death. But this is what he tells his people. He says, I need you to take a lamb, a blameless, spotless lamb. I need you to sacrifice him in such a way. Do not break a bone on his body. And I need you to drain him of his blood. And with that blood, you're going to mark the doorway of your household. And as you mark the threshold of your household, the angel of death will see the blood and he will pass you by. But anyone who doesn't have that blood, oh, does it sound familiar? (laughs) Somebody's going, wait a minute, that kind of sounds like the story of Jesus. God was saying, someday I will send my spotless lamb. He will die for you and for me, and his blood will be shed, and not a bone on his body will be broken. Do you understand that in crucifixion, the, 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 the men that were crucifying were required to break the bone, the legs of the guys being crucified, but they, were, they chose not to with Jesus. You think God had something to do with it? Instead, they stabbed his heart, and as they pierced him through the ribs, blood and water flowed, mingled down. And that's the blood. Oh, come on. Do you see why John said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Do you see why we as Christians say there is power in the blood? And when you claim the blood of Jesus over your family, over the strongholds in your life, they shall be broken. But you've got to believe and understand the power of the blood of Jesus. And this is what happens on Passover The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is put to death, which leads us to the next, the next feast, the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits, listen to this, is observed on the next day after the Sabbath, after Passover. So when was Passover? Friday. We call that Good Friday. The Saturday, the after the Sabbath, after Passover. What is the Sabbath? Saturday. So what day does that define? Sunday is the Feast of First Fruits. Did you know that the Feast of First Fruits, listen to this, the reason you would, uh, God declared that you should give him honor and bring an offering of first fruits is this. As you planted your, your, your wheat, your barley, as you planted this, a little bit would start to come out. And he, and he defined, this is the day that you take this first fruits and you get it from different parts of your crop. You section off your crop, you take, you take, you take, you put it into a sheath, you bring it before God. And this is what you're declaring. Listen to this. You're declaring, Lord, by these first fruits... I'm giving them as an honor to you. You will bless the whole nation. You will bless my whole family. You will multiply it and do more. Listen to this now. Can you see why Jesus Christ, why Jesus Christ said this in John chapter 12, verse 24, when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. 
He dies on Passover. When does he rise? Do you see what he's talking about? He's saying, I'm going to be the first fruits. I'm declaring that what you have seen in me, I'm the first one to come out of the grave. You will all come out of the grave with me. Can you see why Paul says, I am confident of this, that someday I will experience Christ and the power of his resurrection. Why? Because he was first fruits. He showed me. See, a farmer would also look at those first fruits and he could tell, this is good. It's going to be a great harvest. Lord, we're declaring it's going to be a great harvest. Jesus is saying, when you saw me come up on first fruit Sunday, you know it's going to be a great, oh, come on. You know that you know that you know that God has the good stuff. He's got what it takes to raise you up too. And that's what Paul says. That's what all the New Testament says. If Christ could do it, and if God did it for him, the same power that moved and brought him from the grave will bring me forth from the grave. Do you see why first fruits is so important? Now listen to this. It's for this reason that Jesus said, because I live, you will also live. Because I live, you will also live in John 14, 19. A little while longer, the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will also live. Now the last holiday of the feasts is the Feast of Harvest. The Feast of Harvest takes place according to the mandate in Leviticus, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. And that was exactly when? When the Holy Spirit fell. That was exactly when the Holy Spirit fell. And you need to understand something of the Feast of Harvest. It was also a First Fruits type of feast. You could say kind of like a second fruit. The first fruit, listen to this, was typically the barley. The barley grew up first so you could get harvest that and bring it forth. You were to make a cake or a bread unleavened. Unleavened means without what? Yeast. Yeast always represents in the New Testament what? Sin. Sin. Okay? Jesus Christ is that first fruits without what? Unleavened, without sin. Now check this out. At the Feast of Harvest, this is what you're supposed to do. 50 days later, right? 50 days later, you're supposed to gather your first fruits of wheat. Not barley, but wheat now. You're supposed to grind it into a fine powder and you're supposed to present it with leaven. With yeast? The Jewish people? Yeah, that's exactly what the Bible prescribes. What happens at the day of harvest? The Holy Spirit falls and the church is birthed, right? Let me ask you this. Jesus is without leaven because he is perfect. The church is with leaven because she has sin. And how many of, know, how many of you know you can't find a perfect church? Come on now. Can you find a perfect church? I always say, if you find a perfect church, stay away from it, because as soon as you join it, you're going to mess it up. (laughs) Leave it alone. You know, the truth is, now listen to this. You want to hear something really interesting? Some believe this, that at 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 the Feast of Harvest, Chad, you bring these two breads with yeast. is why two? Two churches? Maybe it's for the Gentile church and someday when God calls his Jewish nation back. The Bible says he will call her back. I'm saying this because maybe it's during the seven years of tribulation, but she will be called back. You can ask Isaiah. You can ask Zechariah. You can ask Joel. You can ask... Any one of the great prophets, they talk about calling her back. 
So, so what are we saying here, guys? We're saying very, very clearly that the guarantee when the great harvest takes place, God says he's going to separate the wheat from the what? From the tare. He'll let it grow up together, but then he will separate it at harvest time. What is the guarantee that you'll be wheat? What happened at the day of Pentecost? At the day of celebrating the feast of the harvest, the Holy Spirit is what guarantees that. Read with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. In Romans chapter 6, I'm just going to read a little bit to you. Here we go. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase even more? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been what? United with him in death, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. See that? First fruits. And he goes on. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we shall no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. What is the Bible saying there? The minute you accepted Christ, you were baptized with him. Is he talking about just a, a, a water baptism? Listen to this. In case you're thinking it's a water baptism, stay with me. We're going to get to what Peter says. He really explains it well. But, but watch what Galatians says. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Colossians says this. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been Brought to fullness. Now, I need you to really highlight that verse because some say, no, no, you have a piece of the Holy Spirit, but you don't have all of the Holy Spirit. You need more. It's going to come with the evidence of this and that. I'm not talking about that yet. What I'm hearing here is all the fullness, all the fullness of Christ is in the Spirit. And when you get some of it, you don't get just some. You get the fullness of it. You don't just have a piece of it. You, don't, you get all of it. We need to get this. Listen to what Peter says. Peter says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. What? Are you telling me the church of Christ is right? That baptism does save you? I heard Max Lucado say one time, the Church of Christ insists that you must be baptized water to be saved. How many of you are out of that tradition? Right? It says you must be baptized to be saved. Okay? And he says, and someone will always bring up, but what about the thief on the cross? And a good Church of Christ will say, ah, but it rained. <laughs> I like it. So Peter here is saying baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm not talking about the wet, the, the water washing your body clean. I'm talking about what happens spiritually is what Peter is saying there. The baptism I'm talking about is the one Jesus said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you in power. Now you might say, but pastor, what about 
in those first few instances in Acts when they were already saved and then they got baptized. Guys, we've been talking about this new dispensation. Of course they already knew of Jesus because Jesus had already been on the earth with them, sharing with them the way, right? So they're the only ones that ushered in the new dispensation that actually got saved in a sense through the knowledge and then received the Holy Spirit when he came those 10 days later or those so many days later. And if you want to be technical, there's only two instances. It's with Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it's with the apostles of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. And then in chapter 8 with Samaria. You say, but what about Cornelius? No, they shared the gospel with them. And in the time that they shared the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell. What about the apostles of John? The apostles of John didn't understand salvation. Paul shared salvation with them and they received the Holy Spirit. And so you have it being outlined. The new dispensation is here. The church age has arrived. The church age is made up of Christians who what? Accept the Lord Jesus Christ and immediately are baptized by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're almost done, but I want you to stay with me a little bit longer on some verses here. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What does the Bible say there, Brother David? It says, in him you trusted. When you heard the truth, the gospel of salvation is what I'm talking about. It's like Paul is saying there. Having believed it, you were sealed. With what? You know, he goes on to say in other, in other books, he says, that seal is your guarantee. It's like you're going to stand before God Almighty someday, and he's going to look upon you, and he's going to look for that seal, Keith. And he's going to say, are you mine or are you not? Do you have the Spirit of God or do you not? That happens the day you what? Believe. So let's keep going. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he says this, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Listen to what he says to the Thessalonican church. Do not quench the Spirit. Listen to what he says to the Ephesian church again. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right? So Russell... You have the Holy Spirit the day you believed. But Paul is telling you here, you can quench him, you can grieve him, and you can refuse to be filled by him. Is that true? Must be true. Paul said it. He speaks for Christ. So you see what's happening here? The question is not, have you received the Holy Spirit? That's not a question. If you're saved, you've received the Holy Spirit, period. You've been baptized. You have received it. Let's put that question away. We spent the last hour proving that. Now let's talk about, okay, I have the Holy Spirit, but is it possible for me to live like I don't? Any of you ever done it? Raise your hand if you've ever lived like you don't. So better question is not, do you have him? The better question is, are you allowing him to fill you? This is you. To be filled by the Spirit of God, you must first be empty. But too many times we say, no, Lord, I don't want to empty I like being me. I want what I want. Come on. Can you see why when John had someone come up to him and say, hey, 
the, the disciples of Jesus Christ are baptizing more than you are now. What did John say? He said, that's exactly what needs to happen. I must that he may increase. See, I have to learn how to become nothing that he may become everything. Isn't that what Christianity is all about? Isn't that what Christianity, isn't that what Jesus said? If you truly want to be mine, then learn how to die to yourself. Learn how to put yourself on the cross. Not once in a while, but daily. That's why we've talked about the fact that, who wants this? Nobody wants, come on, Rick. Come on, Rick. Christian's like, I'm, he's raising his hand over here. <laughs> go, go for it, go for it. So listen, we must empty ourselves that he may fill us with his goodness. But too many times we keep a little poop in the bottom and we go, Lord, I kind of like that. Then you go, come on, my stuff is in poop. Anything brought before God that's of you is poop, the prophet Isaiah says. Actually, he says it's like dirty menstrual rags. I hate to go there, but that's what he says. You want to put it this way? Paul says this. Paul says, I used to think that my very best meant something, but now I realize it's nothing but a big pile of crap. He goes, can you say that from the... Paul said worse. He said, that's what it is before God. So do you see why you got to... That he may fill you. And that's what Paul is talking about over here. Quit getting drunk. You go, well, I don't get drunk. Every single one of us have a hang-up, a hold-up, an addiction, a something that draws us away from God being in complete control. For some of us, though, we've sophisticated it. We think, oh, I just have an ambition for success. It's you then. I just have this. I just have that. But what's keeping you from truly being filled with the Spirit of God? And some say, well, in order to truly know that you've been filled with the Spirit of God, listen to this, then you've got to speak in tongues. That's not true. We'll talk about the gifts next time. And many times it showed up that way. But it didn't always show up that way. You've got to do something miraculous. That's not true. You've got to show the evidence of the gifts. That's not true. Paul said this. Do you know why he wrote the first letter to the Corinthian church? Because his young church was going off the rails, so to speak. What do I mean by going off the rails? You read through there. They were doing some crazy things. They were having orgies and they were having big old crazy parties when they were supposed to do the, doing communion and they were competing with one another and they were fighting and bickering and they were creating factions and cliques and I mean, it was crazy. And Paul goes, my children, I, I birthed y'all. I, I shared the gospel with you guys and now, now you're acting like this. And so listen to this, guys. Listen, this is what he says. In the very first chapter, verses 7 and 8, he says, I thank God for you because you come behind in no gift. So right from the beginning, he knows he's going to talk to them about their spiritual gifts because they're using them in the wrong way. They're actually using them. I love Ron's teaching on this. He talks about the gifts are like tools in a toolbox. And the Spirit will give you the tool you need when you need it. If it's tongues, he gives you tongues. If it's healing, he gives you healing. If it's, if it's whatever it is, he'll give you what you need. And listen to what Paul says. He says, the Spirit will give it according to his good pleasure. I want you to remember Bobby Brown's. That's my prerogative because that's kind of how the Spirit says. That's my prerogative, how I give the gifts. You go, really? What? No, never, never mind. Forget Bobby. And I'm not going to dance for you. <laughs> but... But he's saying it's my, the Spirit says it's my prerogative to bless you with the gift. Of, but, but listen to this. They were taking the gifts that the Spirit had given them and they were beating each other up and arguing with each other and saying your gift's not as important as my gift. And look at my gift. My gift is better than your gift. 
And the spirit is going, are you kidding me? You're all one body. You represent Christ. And you're competing and fighting and making, look, making Christ look terrible. And this is what he says. He says, you can have the gifts, which he said, you have them all. You're a gifted bunch of kids, but you're immature because you have not been filled and controlled and empowered and anointed. You have not truly given your life over day by day. Day by day. You have the spirit and you have gifts. So the better mark is not whether or not whether you have gifts or not. The mark is found in Galatians. I didn't put this verse in there, and I don't know why I didn't. I, I fully intended to all the whole time. Turn your Bibles with me to Galatians. And I'm going to go I'm going to go to Galatians 16. He starts with walking in the spirit. I say then walk in the spirit and you shall be fi- and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. For the work of the flesh, they are evident. And these are some. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts. (laughs) Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, what else? Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, you want to know if you truly have the Spirit of God? Quit looking for the evidence and the gifts. Look for the fruit. Doesn't this coincide with what Jesus said? Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. He didn't say you'll know them by their gifts. He said, you'll know them by their fruit. Now we're going to talk about how important the gifts are, but don't get it twisted. If you're not careful, you can get to a point where all you do is think about the gifts and you think that means anointing. It is possible for someone to use his gift very, very impressively and yet not be filled. How many of us have heard stories of pastors who have done that have used their God-given gift to prophesy in such an amazing way, and yet they fall having done some things and having been doing some things that were really questionable. Fruit. We're going to talk a little bit more about being filled, but I want to... I want to share these last verses. Ron compiled them for me. I don't want to share all of them, but if you think about this with me for a second. You have here the differentiation between being baptized and being filled. And I love some of the examples he gave about being filled. He talks about how the disciples would pray and the Spirit would fall upon them and He would 
filled them and they had power. We talked about that this week during our, during our teaching time on Sunday morning. But I also want to share with you a verse. Which one is it, Ron? We're talking about P, uh, Stephen. Stephen before the Sanhedrin, which is Acts 6 and 7 before the Sanhedrin. Do you have that up there? Here we go. Brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters chose seven men from among, choose seven men from among you. One of the men that they chose was Stephen. They chose him to be a man of God. But why did they choose him? Look at the next verse here. This pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, he, what did he do? He looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They ultimately stoned him to death. But he prayed and the Holy Spirit empowered him, anointed him, filled him. 